So welcome, my name is Nicole Bartlett and I'm gonna be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner in this effort is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. To find out more about future webinars, you can look under their education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the sixth, seventh webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closure. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA. That's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Heather Tabasola, a research coordinator at the Joint Institute for the Study of Atmosphere and Ocean at the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. This is in Seattle, Washington. She's gonna to talk to you about her job and some very cool technology she gets to work with to explore and understand the ocean. A few guidelines before I introduce Heather. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I will be keeping track for Heather. She'll stop every now and then and answer a few. As I'm continuing in the introduction, you can also uh, use the chat box to let us know where you're dialing in from because we'd love to see the geographic spread of our participants. Depending on your device, how you access the question box may be different. For some of you, it could be a question mark on the bottom or side of the screen. Others might have a little box with an arrow and a hand. Click on the arrow to show the question box. We will not be using the raise hand function. All right, Heather, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Sure. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you might be, or very early morning. I'm excited to hear where everybody's joining in from today. Um, again, I'm Heather, and Nicole, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to talk to everybody um, that's going to be joining us, and hopefully those listening later as well. Uh, I am Heather Tabasola. I live in Seattle, Washington, and I am a research coordinator, which means I facilitate collaboration and operations of many projects um, and communicate that work to managers and stakeholders and today all of you. So I work at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory and for the NOAA Cooperative Institute at the University of Washington, as Nicole said. Um, there are 16 cooperative institutes that NOAA um, collaborative works with various institutions across the United States and the Joint Institute the study of atmosphere and ocean at the University of Washington is just one of them. Um, and PNEL is one of many NOAA labs. We are housed within NOAA research. So there are many different divisions of NOAA and you have heard from several of them already. Um, and our lab focuses basically on global observations and we do that in many different ways. But one of the very unique parts about our lab is that we have a engineering division. So not only do we get to work globally, so we have scientists all always deployed on various ships or working on different instruments and technologies, um, whether it's from Arctic or into the tropics or even um, the Antarctic. Uh, we also have an engineering division that helps us kind of achieve those goals and those long off missions or those, those scientific questions that we just really want to get at, but we don't quite know how to do it. And so we constantly have scientists and, and engineers working together. And that's one of the really, I think, unique parts about, um, about PML and the job I get to do every day because I'm facilitating between those scientists and engineers and all the different projects that we're working on. Um, and my research focuses on the Arctic. And for NOAA, that's not just above the Arctic Circle. That's actually the Bering Sea off of Alaska, northward. And it's my work is focused on fisheries, oceanography on one group and the new technologies on the other group. And that's how we got to talking about the sail drone today. So I am gonna tell you a little bit about me and as I learn to navigate the screen here. So I didn't grow up in Seattle. I grew up in New England, um, you know, constantly toes in the water, biking Cape Cod Canal and sailing the coast. 
And I was lucky enough to, to attend a high school with a maritime focus. So um, we had a 92 foot iron held schooner called the Tabor Boy, and she still sails off the New England coast and off to Bermuda and races as of late. Um, and that's a picture of me in high school standing on the bow of our boat um, with the USS Constitution in the background. Um, we got to take classes there like celestial navigation, which I was terrible at, um, naval architecture, and obviously we got to do some sailing. And then um, I went to the University of New Hampshire and I got the job of my dreams pretty much my senior year and immediately following college and I got to work with right whales. So you heard Allison talk, I think last week. And so that picture on the upper right hand side with the green Boston hat, that's um, a right whale feeding in the background. And um, after that, I, you know, as things go, I just followed adventure and chased the midnight sun. And that was about five or six years of working for the offshore oil and gas industry. And then I got here to Seattle. So you never know where life is gonna take you and what you're gonna end up doing. Um, one of the interesting projects I did in college, which allowed me to work with right whales right away, Let's see, don't mind me. Is um, they do a class that's joint between scientists and engineers. And little did I know at this time, you know, my senior year in college, that my adult self would be doing this on a daily basis in Seattle. And so this really almost ugly looking pink thing is actually a bunch of styrofoam board put together on a pole that has been shaved down to look like a right whale. And we were working on a project with two other engineers to build a scale model of a right whale and to simulate entanglement in the testing tanks at UNH. We built the model, we tested it once, it broke, and that's about as far as we got. But it was a really good practice about just all the different questions and and the different perspectives that engineers bring to scientists in the problems that you can kind of solve together. Because a lot of times scientists like, you have your way of doing something and an engineer will come in and they're like, all right, well, let's start from the beginning. Let's start new drawing board, clean slate. Let's try something new. Have you thought about this? Maybe we could do this. And so they're really problem solvers and it's a really neat integration and way um, to figure out science. So, okay, so hopefully it's just the webcam now. Um, Nicole, can you tell me where people are joining in from today? Sure, Heather. Um, we have folks from New York, uh, Wisconsin, Georgia, Vermont, Virginia, Maryland, Maine, different parts of Massachusetts, of course, um, Cape Cod, um, <laughs> and as far as Ontario. Um, so we've got a pretty good mix. Um, someone already asked, um, Raven would love to know, what's your favorite part of your job right now? Oh, good morning, Raven. Thank you for the question. Um, favorite part of my job right now is when we are sitting in a room and I say we, that's like me and maybe a team of about 10 people. And we set up, we've like set up a mission. Let's say we're working with the sail drone and we get to do something. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's just every time you hit a milestone, you launch a new technology, um, something that's successful, or even if it's not successful, those moments are so fun because you have a whole group to share them with and a story to tell later. So I think that's one of the most fun parts. Cool. Oh, we already have someone wants to know that they're here from Las Vegas too. So you've got um, you got even more folks still logging in. Um, do you want to? Uh, and we're already getting questions about the sail drones, so maybe you can jump back to your next slide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Katie says hi from Texas. Hi, Sloan Katie. wants to know if you're an engineer. What was your schooling in? Did you mention that? Yeah, Sloan, I am not an engineer. My degree is in marine and freshwater biology, and I always wanted to work with whales, but I have an interest 
I love solving problems. So even though I'm not an engineer, um, I get to work with engineers every day. But my background is more on the bio biological side. Cool. All right. Okay. So this is our first game of the day for everybody joining in. And it might be a trick question. All right. But we have four images up on the screen. And if you could, in the chat, maybe tell Nicole which one you think is a sail drone. Okay, so everybody can use the chat. We've got a couple of A's coming in. Um, okay. A few people are, one person, Riley thinks none of them are sail drones. So same with Joshua. Um, let's see, a couple of C's. Yeah. Are you going to tell us? I will tell you. Yeah. Um, Joshua and Riley, you guys are right on track. And maybe you've also watched some of the other NOAA seminars. So in here, B is actually one of the NOAA planes. And this is one of the twin otters. So this is what Allison talked about when she was talking about right whales and doing aerial surveys. And when, let's see, C is the Okeanos Explorer. So that's one of the NOAA vessels. And you're going to hear more about that this week. D is a satellite. And I think Kara talked about that last week. Um, but it's a kind of a type of drone, right? Because it's up in the sky and um, it tells us data and it's automated. And A is, I think, what a lot of people think sail drones look like. And this is sort of that mini helicopter looking thing, but this is actually the drones that you can sort of get on the internet and you can use yourself or that maybe Amazon will one day be delivering with, um, or that Katie will be talking about next week during Alaska week and how they use this to look at marine mammals. So for Joshua and Riley, you are right. This big orange thing is the sail drone. <laughs> this is what we've been using for five years at least in my group, to go up and study the Arctic ecosystem. And so just to give you a little bit of scale, the drones are pretty big. When we first started five years ago, they were smaller. They were a different design. So you'll see different images of the drones throughout the years through the presentation. So if you um, want a game to play along, you can kind of see how um, the drones have changed a little bit and you can write that down. Um, so we have a human, a, a drawing of a person here. And, you know, let's say this is me about five, seven. Um, the drone itself is about 23 feet long. And if you think of a normal school bus, a school bus is about 36 feet. So it's probably about two thirds that length. And then the drone itself is about 15 feet tall. And I don't know how many basketball fans we have out there, but I played basketball for a long time. So basketball is one of my favorites. And if you know, let's say Brittany Griner, her wingspan, that's her arms out wide, is about seven feet, which is kind of amazing. So that's about two of her arm lengths tall. Um, surprisingly, when you see them from a boat, they look really little, really, really little. And so even though, um, they're pretty big, they're orange because, or this reddish orange, so that people can see them from vessels. It's actually more for safety than it is of just being really bright and kind of a fun color to paint, paint a drone that's doing research. So I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen for a sec. Nicole, are there any other questions right now? Yeah, someone wants to know how you get inside that sail drone. <laughs> All right, let's see if I have, all right, let's see. Well, one of the interesting things about sail drones is they are fully autonomous. So unlike when we typically use research vessels to go out to sea, not a single person needs to go on this drone. So I'm sharing with you a picture of one of the drones. This was actually, um, I've never seen the drone in the water. I've only ever seen the drone in person, and this was that time, just to give you another um, scale size. But you can see also, I'm not sure I would even fit in the drone. It's so packed with sensors and equipment to study the ocean 
that I don't think I could even squeeze in there. Um, but no, it's fully autonomous. So there's not a single person who goes in there. We we drive it. Um, well, I'll show you in a little bit how we drive it. Maybe some of you can guess on how we remotely um, drive an ocean robot. Yeah, Brenner has some ideas. I think so, he thinks you might use some kind of remote control. Okay. Um, and other uh, um, other folks are echoing that too, um, like Ellie. Um, and we're starting to get additional questions. So yeah. oh, Samantha thinks they're remote. Computer radar says Riley. Ooh, so okay. a lot of questions about um, how they, uh, well, more about the operations, which I know you're going to get into. So yeah. I think you can continue. Yeah, so I'm going to skip to a video quick and I'm going to show you how we launch and drive the drones. And it might be a little delayed, so bear with us here. So what you're seeing is one of our probably second year launch in Alaska. This is in Dutch Harbor. So this is an older, older version of the sail drone. And there's a couple things that you'll see. One, we're on a small boat right near a dock. Two, the gentleman in the in the movie is holding his phone over the water, which makes me nervous every time I see it. And then the drone just goes away off into um, the mountainous area of Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and then sails further north. So one of the interesting things about that is they're driving the drone they're starting it off with just their phone just their phone so they have a whole system that sits in their phone that you can set waypoints for the drone and when richard who started sail drone that's the gentleman in the in the video he pushes the drone off lets it go and then all of a sudden the it just takes over on the system on the computer and basically it uses satellites to relay that information back to California. Um, but in Seattle, or if you're in Antarctica, New Zealand, um, you can access that information from the drone that you're using and you can navigate through a system. So um, if I can get to it fast, I'll swap to that. But um, yeah, essentially you could be flying, you could be on your way somewhere, you could be having dinner with friends, and you could change the where you want the drone to go depending on what you're using it for. So um, this, for an example, this summer, this past summer, when we were using our sail drone mission, we were actually chasing ice. And we would have to look at all sorts of different ice products from different satellites. And we could kind of look at that and then if we could see maybe temperatures were getting really low, we might re-navigate the drone away from the area that we were heading in. So it's really adaptive. You can change things pretty quickly. Um, you know, obviously you're still relying on satellites to send the data back. So there's, you know, a little bit of a lag, um, but we see the data in real time. We can navigate the drones in real time. Um, and this is, this is really one of the best features of getting to use the sail drone for our science. What other questions do we have, Nicole? Uh, so uh, uh, one one person, Raven, would love to know, how does the drain, drone move in the water? Um, yeah. they, al they also want to know, you know, if they've ever, uh, Noah wants to know if it's ever crashed into anything or did it tip over? How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So one of the really neat parts about our project, so PMEL was the first group to work with sail drone. So when Richard designed the drone, it was actually about a 10 year design process for him. He actually holds, um, and I can't even imagine doing this, what's called the land speed record. So he took a previous model of the drone and they call it a land yacht. And he took it into the like Mojave Desert and he took it and went super, super fast. And basically that took him about 10 years to achieve the record.
But then he decided to take that design and turn it into the Saildrum. So when we first started working with Saildrum, the company, PMEL was bringing expertise to put in sensors, like our oceanographers saying, okay, we definitely need to look at how salty the water is, what the temperature of the water is, and here's all the other different questions that we might have that we want to address. And we picked the Arctic to start because the Arctic is really remote. It's really harsh. It's dictated by ice, strong winds, and it's a really limited time that we can get up there. So if you look through like some of the images, you see that the drone has evolved over time. So it started off with almost like what a Hobie cat has, you know, so it works like a sailboat. So it's powered by solar panels. So the sun, and then it moves using wind. So if we don't have any wind, that can be a tough time, right? But if we have a lot of wind, then, then it moves really great. And it basically operates like a sailboat would operate just without having a human on it. And, you know, testing it in the Arctic brings some really um, interesting kind of adventures and expeditions to it. But thus far, we have not broken a drone in the Arctic. There are different missions, like um, drones recently just circumnavigated Antarctica, and three of them launched from New Zealand, but two of them had to come home right away. Um, there was a mission at the Atlantic where the wings snapped because they hit like a huge hurricane. But the amazing part is they haven't lost a drone yet. They've been able to hobble them back to shore or be able to retrieve them. And so every time that that's happened, they've modified the drone so that it's stronger and with, can withstand things like hurricanes and really big seas, um, ice, those kind of things. So Heather, while you're switching to your slide, one more question from Caroline. She wants to know, is there a live video feed from the drone that, you, that you're watching or is it just showing you where it is um, on your phone or computer? Yeah, that's a great question, Caroline. And actually, I am going to show you, I just had to get there, two slides on kind of what it looks like. So we talked about you can see it on your phone and then Obviously, you can log in on a laptop at any time or your computer. So this is typically what we see. We see um, this is Alaska here. So um, very northern point is McDavick or Barrow. And then the far left sort of point is Bering Strait. So that's that 14 mile wide area between us and Russia or US and Russia. Um, so this is just looking at one of our missions. And this is kind of typically what we'll see. So we see a map on the left and we can see the track line those numbers there sd number are the different drones that we're using and then to the right you can see the data that's being sent back by that drone so we see the data in real time we see where they are and this is really unique because if you're on a ship you can see some of the data but if you have a mooring in the water which is something that oceanographers have used for a really long time um, you don't see that data in real time. And so this is a really unique, uh, unique feature that we have. So we get the data back in real time. And then this is sort of how we see images. It's really expensive to send data. It's not cheap, but we can do it because we have a lot of satellites. So we don't send video back. And we don't really have video. There's GoPros on the sail drone. So there's four GoPros and you can see those four images here. So basically like face left, right or port and starboard and then upward and downward. And a lot of that is partially to see how the sail drone moves through the water, like how it's doing as we're testing these missions. Um, but also, yeah, to see like what's around us like you typically would if you were on a vessel or standing watch, right? So this is, um, this is how we would see images and we can request them more often. So when we worked in the near the ice and often in the ice this past summer, we were getting images back much faster so that we could see where we are and have better um, awareness of what we were near. But typically we probably get them two or three times a day. And then at the end of the mission, we'll see all, we'll see all of the images. So we don't get them back in real time or video, but that would be really neat if we could.
Very cool. Um, while you're moving on to your next slide, um, Samantha and Wesley, both from totally different places, want to understand how much does it cost to build a sail drone? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I actually don't know how much it costs to make the sail drone. Um, that would be a great question for Richard, and we can probably send that in and ask him. Um, essentially, sail drone builds the sail drone, the, the drones, the vehicles, and then our group basically kind of rents them. So they run a lot of the controls and we just get to tell it where to go and what sensors to put in, which is a really fun way to do science. Yeah, and I just wanted to clarify, a, a number of people are asking about how the drone sends the information back. And maybe, can you explain satellite telemetry a little bit so that they understand how the data travels? Oh, goodness. Well, here's the, yikes. Uh, <laughs> Kara addressed this yeah. really well. <laughs> um, essentially, any of the data that's collected, it gets turned into little tiny bits of information, and then it gets translate, transmitted to satellites. Right, so there's little different pieces of information that transmits the data out, and then that's retrieved. Satellites in the sky first is where it goes, and then it's retrieved back by computers in California, and then that's how we get the projection. So satellites in the sky not only give us data about the ocean, but it helps us collect that data and and transmit it to those of us here on land. Yeah, it's kind of like a like a cell phone tower in space in a way. It, it, it yeah. connects us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nicole. <laughs> okay, and lots of questions about how far they go and how many are out there. And I know you're getting to those things, so I'm just going to um, yeah. hold off for now on more questions. Yeah, okay. Just trying to find the right slide to start with here. Okay. So one of the things, let's see. So our... Um, one of the things that we've we've used the drones for, and it's changed every year, right? So we started working with sail drone to help build the sensors and determine what what were the best sensors um, to go into the drone. And when I say sensors, you know, for everything that you want to monitor, right? So if you want to look at the temperature, you have different sensors, and there's different companies, right? So who's making the best sensor to put into the drone, and how do we test that? Um, and it's it's really another interesting part is just how fascinating um, implementation, like putting the sensors in, integrating them, retrieving that data that is. And I, that's just not a part of science I was really part of until, until these missions. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about one of the more um, fun missions that we did, and it was our first joint mission. So we had, gone up into the Bering Sea the first year and just kind of to test out the instruments, test out the drone, see how it did. And then the second year, we elevated that a little bit, put on some more complicated instruments, like things to look at fish, um, things to look at the currents in the water, uh, how um, CO2 or ocean, ocean acidification is happening in Alaska and be able to use the drone to monitor much bigger areas to study these things. Um, but one of the neat ones that we did was in 2017, and this was a joint project between our lab at, at NOAA Research or OAR and Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And we started combining not just the oceanography, so all those basic parameters and things that we wanted to look at, but also looking at the fish population. So one of the really neat things in the Bering Sea is that they've been doing surveys for a really long time, looking at populations of walleye pollock using echo sounders on boats. But we were able to take an echo sounder that had been miniaturized, made much smaller, um, uses less power, is just smaller in size for moorings. And then we were able to put that on the drone and use that. And then we also looked at fur seals. So there was a project of tag going out to St. Paul Island, tagging fur seals, and then having the sail drones follow them. And then we even listened for whales. So we even tried this out. And this was just such a neat project because all of a sudden you're using this tool that you've tested in the area that, that's handled the weather 
seems to be taking really good measurements. And now we're really going to put it to the test of how the ecosystem is changing in the Arctic. The Arctic is such a rapidly changing place, and we just don't have enough person power to be up there. We don't have enough ship time to be there when we want to be. And this particular project really addressed um, being able to combine things like working on a research boat and tagging seals, but that normally their times don't overlap. But they're looking at things that, if we could look at them together, could actually tell us a really amazing story. And that is also another really cool thing about the sail drone, because if you don't have a ship or you can't be out there and you get to sit at your desk, but you get to do this research that you you wanted to do for a really long time, but now it's allowing you to do it. So it's it's kind of supporting the research that we already do with ships and moorings, um, but also just really opening up new avenues, right? It's faster. It can be out there for a really long time. We can move it when we want to. So in the case of chasing or following fur seals um, for this mission, um, it's something that had never been tried. And now, a couple years later, a paper has been published and not only has it shown that it's a great tool to follow fur seals, but also that it's um that it can survive survive that region and should be a tool that's that's used in the future for these kind of studies so what other questions can we answer nicole i'm curious are you do you want to show that video now since you were just talking about that um project yeah sure because people are asking what kind of things the drone has seen and um, we're getting that question from a number of different folks and how far can the drone go and how fast? So I know you have a couple of videos okay. you wanna show. Yeah, okay, so let's see. So this is what you're seeing on the screen is a map of where the drone went. So that's um, the orange tracks and then the black line and kind of greenish line in between, there's two, two different drones here. And so those are the two different tracks. Um, the orange part you see is sort of like the corridor, what we call the corridor that's used for navigating the drone. So we don't just set waypoint from point A to point B. We set sort of this, um, sort of like driving a car, right, your lanes. And you can't go outside of those lanes well the drone also knows not to go outside of their corridor and so this is what helps keep them kind of on how to get to point a to point b faster right um and then you'll see the purple lines on there and those are the first seal dives so i said that not only did we tag the first seals so you can see the picture in the top right that's a northern first seal that has the tag on it so researchers like Carrie Kuhn, um, and I think we put some of the links in. She has an amazing blog that was done, some great articles about the paper that just came out. So I definitely encourage you to read up, um, follow up on that a little bit more. Um, those fur seals were then tracked. And so these are um, female fur seals and uh, lactating moms, right? So they come to the island, they come to forage off the island and then basically to feed their pups. And there's a huge decline in the population, which is why Carrie's looking at this. So we were able to follow those fur seals. Um, sorry, in that, I'm just gonna pause this for a second. My slides are all backwards here. There we go. So in a really neat way of viewing those dives, This is what those dives look like. Now, this isn't necessarily a super scientific image. It's just a really neat visual to look at. And so that epicenter, the, the center part is essentially the island. And those are all the moms, the lactating moms that are um, that we tagged. And those are their different dives. And what we're looking at with that is using the drone to follow certain individuals and then for those particular ones, we also had a second video camera on, so we could actually see from the point of the first seal. And really what we're trying to look at is all these different dives is what the first seals are eating. So that's how we use the fish acoustics with that too. And I wanna get to the video. There's okay, a way. Yeah. Should be, yeah. This should be playing, but I think it's a little slow. So what you're looking at, 
is the head of a northern fur seal going through the water. So you can see it's kind of flipper, and then it's going to catch a fish at the end. <laughs> so this is just really neat. Like when have you, you know, it's like the National Geographic critter cams, right? <clears throat> um, it just gives you this amazing inside look. I'll let it kind of play for a little bit. Inside look at the fur seal's life. But, you know, it's not just cool. It's actually telling a story. So this fur seal is being tagged not only with a video camera, but also looking at its diving behavior, how long those dives are, how deep those dives are. And then we can combine that with the fish finder that's on the sail drone to look at what they've been eating. So it's a really amazing way to look at this ecosystem to start to solve problems of maybe why these fur seals are declining or maybe how much fish are in the water at this particular time when they're foraging or feeding. And um, Heather, a quick yeah. question. Um, so can you tell the kids what a, a lactating seal means? Like why we care about lactating seals? Yeah, so just, um, Lactating seals are basically seals that have had pups or baby, like their baby seals. And when they're lactating, that's the milk <clears throat> that they're using to feed the seals. And that's, um, you know, really rich milk, but the seals need to eat to generate that milk. And so if they're traveling a really long distance to find food, then they just may not be with their pup as long as they need to be. Um, or be, not be able to provide the nourishment needed to raise those healthy pups. Great, thank you. So um, do you, is this a good time to show the animation about sort of the, where the sail drones go? We're still getting some questions about how fast they travel and how oh, far. Yeah. Okay, so we'll navigate to that. So we do have a little, I'll actually, I think just show the, so I'm just going to show, I think, the map because the video is a little bit laggy. <clears throat> so this is one of the missions. So this is a map. So <clears throat> this is all of Alaska. Here you can see. Um, so Aleutian Islands, Alaska, all the way up to Nome. And then the coloration is the track of the sail drones. So one of the interesting parts about Alaska is that the entirety of the Bering Sea is, well, not the entirety of it, but it's almost the size of like California, like you can fit it in there. And the Aleutian chain is the entirety of the Eastern seaboard. So really Alaska, its coastline is the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, the West Coast, um, and the Great Lakes combined. And that's a lot, a lot of areas. So this is a big place. So up until this year, our drones probably traveled in average, let's see, we'd be deployed for like three to four months and um, we probably travel an average of maybe like 20 to 30,000 um, kilometers. And then this last particular, this last summer, we had six drones out and their total collective distance traveled is more than one time around the earth at the equator just in this region alone. So it is really big and the miles do rack up, but we've been doing the missions now for about five years. So we've probably done a couple trips around the equator and that's just in the Arctic alone. Um, somebody had asked earlier how many drones are out there and my particular group doesn't have any out right now, but I think sail drone themselves between all the different projects um, at NOAA and other, other research uh, places, I think there's somewhere between 20 and 30 that might be deployed. So, really covering the globe, really looking at a lot of different issues um, in our world's oceans and definitely traveling a lot of miles. Uh, on average, they travel about two to three kilometers. Um, and then obviously they travel like a sailboat. So if it's really windy, then they, they'll go much faster. But oftentimes, um, if they go too fast, it, it might interfere with the data. It has been shown a little bit to interfere with some of our data. Can they, uh, Sloan wants to know, can the speed be controlled in that, in that situation remotely? 
we cannot control the speed no um you could if you were like in a storm and that would really be up to sail drone and how they would want to navigate it's so similar to like working with a sailboat um you know if you're in a storm and you need to head a certain direction obviously we put the safety of the drone first versus you know the science but it really just depends on what the situation is but in general we don't we wouldn't try to slow slow it down we would just try to make sure that it's moving safely and um and we come home great um so just a time check we've got just a few minutes left and i know you had kind of a game that you wanted to play with the kids yeah um, so let's see if we can get that up yeah so you guys had asked a lot sort of um what we get to see and and that's always really fascinating i mean the data is really the most fascinating part but um because we're all quarantined at home, this is far more fun right now to play a game about what we can see from the drone. Um, and this would be a typical view, what you're looking at. Um, this was taken from the US Coast Guard Cutter Healy on one of the missions that we were doing them comparing our data with the vessel data. Um, and so these were two of the drones that were out. So this is sort of what you would see if you were with a really big zoom lens on the bow of the boat. And then we toggle over here we are gonna do okay oops okay so first up on the screen and this is from the pacific ocean this is not from um our arctic mission but it is from one of the pmel's missions can you guys in the chat do you have an idea of what might be lingering underneath this drone okay so what we're looking at is we're looking down from the sail Right. We're looking Onto down from it. the top of the wing. Yep. Yeah. Top of the and wing. Okay. I've got some guesses. Samantha says, let's see, dolphins. We have right whales, sharks, gray seals. A lot of people think they're sharks. Um, whales, tuna. Sophia thinks it might be a tuna. Um, there are lots of whales, seals, dolphins. So no consensus, really. We've got a bunch of different guesses. All right. Well, my, let's see. So what you're looking at is the underside of a humpback whale. And so I'll show the circle. So you can see sort of the two things on the side are the really big pectoral fins, and these are white on the underside. And then you see sort of that line in the top of the middle, and that's the underside of its, of its jaw. Um, and so the really fascinating thing again about these like photos is a how clear they kind of are and B we don't get them back very often. So the fact that or even like the drone doesn't take them continuously. So it's not like they're video recording. They're taking set images every couple minutes. So the fact that you're even able to capture these kind of things is pretty amazing. This is one from one of our Arctic missions. This is one of my favorite photos that the drone has captured. Uh, can you guess what this is? And go ahead and put that in the chat. Hmm. And for my more advanced observers, because I know there's a lot of birders out there as well, maybe you want to guess what kind it is. So I have um, a least tern, a seagull, um, arctic tern is another one. Someone guessed an albatross. Hmm. Um, Seagulls, lots of seagulls. Um, Arctic tern again, that seems to be a common one. Yeah. You guys are good. It helps when you know the location too, I think. Yeah, this yeah. is totally an Arctic tern, which is why I think this is even cooler that the drone captured it. The tern, terns have that fork um, on their tail and the, the black cap, um, pretty noticeable wing. But again, like just to capture this and be so clear, kind of fun um and i of course really like this game because i spent a lot of my life being an observer so these are things that i would be looking for on boats so there you go arctic turn let's see here's a fun one too we would always joke about this happening what do you guys think is here on the drone this is also on one of our missions in the arctic everyone says a seal, a fur seal. Um, 
lots of guesses for seals and a few harbor seals. Someone says a leopard seal. Ooh. I do not think it's a manatee. Um, wrong region. Yeah. Also leopard seal, wrong region. <laughs> not in the Arctic. Yeah. Uh, leopard seal. So uh, the consensus seems to be a seal. Are you going to tell us what kind? Yes, this is definitely a seal. And when we ran into this, um, the fun part about being in NOAA is you have so many experts. So we messaged the folks next door um, who focus on seal work to see what kind of species this was. And they helped us identify that it's a young or juvenile spotted seal. And what's really kind of fun about this is this is on one of the drones that studies um, CO2 or what Jessica Cross is looking at, she's looking at ocean acidification in the waters off of Alaska. And you could see on the time the seal was on the drone, it kept creeping up more forward towards the sensing equipment, that little black kind of tower you see just forward of it. And you could actually in her data, and it didn't really mess it up, it was just a couple blips, you could see the respiration of the seal. So we thought that was kind of nice. It hitched a ride for a couple hours in what seemed to be a really productive area um, where we were in the Arctic. So kind of neat that it also tells a story and helps us look, um, gives us another image of sort of what's happening with the data. Because if we didn't have that image, she might have thrown out that piece of data, right? Or not known what to do with it or had a different question. But instead we knew that the, there was a seal. All right, so here's another fun one. What do you guys think is in this image? Hmm. Okay, let's see. Everybody send their guesses in. Somebody thinks it's a whale. Somebody says fish, shark. Oh, man. So yeah. I'll give you a hint. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It might be weather. Oh, I see. So it's not an animal. So that 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 light area that we're seeing next to the drone is just a part of the drone. It is. That's actually the the echo sounder, or it's simply called the fish finder. So that's the piece of equipment that is actually the keel. And at the very end of the keel is where we have the echo sounder that sends out the pulses to listen um, to receive data back on on the from the fish to see how big the groups are. Um, oh wait, I think. I think some people are getting wise to it. So Sophia, Laura, people are starting to see the snow on the drone. Yeah. yeah, this was really fun, right? Because this drone is going to the Arctic and it wasn't quite near the ice, but it started snowing. And the next thing you know, the temperature on the drone is really cold. <laughs> so what's also interesting about this is it's another test in a really remote environment, but how do things still work when it's that cold? Right, if you were to take a car into a really cold area, you'd have to keep it warm all the time, but we don't have any sunlight right now, right? Because it's snowing. Um, so, you know, you saw when we looked at the data, there was definitely um, some interference or you could tell that things got colder, but it still worked really well. And that's just another amazing part about this piece of equipment, right? We can take it, we can almost take it anywhere. So this was um, almost as far north as we ever traveled, which was 75.49 degrees north. Um, and that's about 10 degrees above the Arctic Circle. So I think the last one, this one's sort of a giveaway. What do you guys think we're seeing here? All right, last one. James says ice. <laughs> uh, ice seems to be the consensus here. Uh, everyone agrees that we're looking yes. at ice or sea ice. Yes, you guys are all right. Um, very smart. Um, yeah, this is this past summer. When we first started working with the drone, we wanted to get to the sea ice. We didn't necessarily want to get into the sea ice. Um, and we ended up getting into the sea ice many times uh, this past summer. And that's really a testament to, again, also why we need the drones where we do, because it's such a remote area and satellites just don't have enough data to tell us all the things we need to navigate. So taking the drone this far north into um, some of these ice bands gave us some really unprecedented data, like 
something that you wouldn't do unless you were the polar stern who's stuck in the ice right now. Um, yeah, so this is this is the ice and it's a little bit nerve wracking. But again, who is it Joshua who asked earlier, I can't remember um, if we had damaged the drones and, you know, we put these in the ice maybe one too many times this summer um, where we had some scratches on the hull, but, you know, they all came home and they were still all working. So we got our data and the scientists are working that up. Okay, good, because a lot of people were concerned that it was still stuck there, so. It is definitely not. The ice certainly melted. These are not, um, this is not old ice. This was new ice that forms every year. These were bands um, that satellites couldn't see. Um, we would love to get to the, the what we call the true ice edge, um, but we can't even get to that because what happens is the ice starts to melt and it starts to break off and it creates these bands and it creates these things that satellites can't pick up because they're just not big enough. And um, there's just not enough data there to tell the satellites that, hey, there's some ice chunks floating about for us to even use for navigation. So that's really how we ended up um, ended up in the ice. But it all melted out. So, <laughs> so we have, um, since we have to wrap up, um, can you tell us like what is the most common thing that the the drone sees i mean obviously it's collecting a lot of data on you know atmospheric and ocean conditions but what is the most common sighting like from the camera oh gosh i don't uh i mean is it more <laughs> research oriented in other words if you're looking for seals you're you're if you're doing the first seal work you're up by first seals or if you're so is there anything What's the like craziest thing that the sail drones ever caught um, on camera that you can think of? Oh, I think that's pretty cool. The humpback was really cool. That's a pretty new one. Um, we've definitely seen blue sharks, but I think in the Arctic, I mean, honestly, the spotted seal was one of the first one. Um, we had kind of always joked about all the work of like following fur seals that one would eventually haul out on the drone. Um, and I still haven't seen it, but the watching the young spotted seal kind of hitch a ride for a couple hours was was really interesting. But we don't, I mean, the photos and the images are great to have and it certainly um, is more charismatic uh, to look at. But, you know, the important part is really the data that it's sending back and, and the ability that he's, you know, scientists like Jessica and Carrie, um, you know, when we're looking at how the Arctic environment is changing, being able to get data back in real time, being able to use it, have extended missions, have these, uh, have this equipment that's faster, that can go to these really remote places. Um, that's really the important part because the Arctic is changing so fast and we just can't be up there and we really need this data. So using even just temperature, basic temperature, basic salinity, how, um, how river runoff is affecting the water um, and how far out it's going, what chlorophyll we're seeing, like are there phytoplankton? Is there food in the water to support the ecosystem and the food web? And so all just really interesting things that come back. So even though the data looks like a bunch of lines, once you start crunching it and you can really start telling these stories of what's happening, that's really the most important part. Well, that is really cool, Heather. We are so grateful for your time today. Um, I think we're going to wrap up. Was there any anything last things that you wanted to show or? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say um, two things. So one, you know, this project, like I talked about in the beginning, is really such a big collaboration, part of a huge group. So these missions, when we go out, like I help coordinate them, but we're talking 70 to 100 people that are participating in these missions. Just scientists who are looking at different questions, um, and you could never fit that many people on a research vessel. Um, so that's another really amazing part that we have these engineers at PML who are working with Sail Drone to integrate sensors, to make these hulls stronger, to look at all the different data, to work with the scientists to achieve the questions that they need, like miniaturizing sensors so that we can look at more things with a drone. Um, and then also I would just encourage everybody who joined in today, one of the things I know I haven't done enough during quarantine um, is use the other side of my brain. And I know that I really love to um, draw and write. Um, and I've just been focused on taking care of two little kids and trying to get my work done at the same time. But I would encourage you to, um, you know, sometime this week, pick up pen, pencil, whatever it is that you want and that you're um, drawing of choice or even your, your surface and 
you know, draw a place or write about a place, if that is more your thing, um, that you've explored or that you want to explore. And just take that time to think about it, be creative. I never thought that I would get to explore like this in the Arctic with a piece of equipment called a sail drone. Um, and it's just been such a fascinating adventure. And I don't know, Nicole, if there's a place that maybe people can send, uh, send in their images or their stories, um, but I will do one as well because I think I need to in quarantine time. And um, just encourage everybody, just kind of think for a minute, like if you could be an explorer, you are an explorer, where do you want to go or where have you been that's been you know, captivated and um, that you remember or want to remember? Yeah, they do have a way to send emails uh, in. They can either send them to um, myself or Grace. Um, so Grace's uh, email is G Simpkins, S I M P K I N S, at W H O I HUI.edu. And I'll just send that link out to everybody in the chat box so that they have that. Awesome. Um, I think you also have my email as part of the webinar registration, and so we can accept those too. And we will, um, we can put the stories and pictures up on the website. So yeah. thank you, Heather. That's a great idea. Um, and so for so everybody, <laughs> what's that? I said just thank you, everybody, for joining in this morning. It's it's a real treat yeah, to we, do. We had some great. We had we even had someone from Poland let me know that they were on the line. Um, and additional folks from Las Vegas and Texas and Minnesota. So you were really um, taking sail drone to the masses today. So thank you for that. Um, I got loads and loads of questions and I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your question today. I encourage you to go uh, onto um, a website and research some of the information on the questions that you didn't get. Heather included some links about sail drone. Um, in the webinar registration page at the HUI website. Um, so you can go there. And then this webinar wall is will be recorded. Um, and so that will be available in a few days. Um, join us on Wednesday at the same time when we talk to one of our hurricane hunter NOAA pilots from the NOAA Corps, who's gonna talk to us about flying scientists in and around hurricanes to collect information for weather forecasting. So we hope to see you then. Thanks, Heather. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.